Hello, and welcome to Brokenomics. And this episode is going to be called What Would I Do? This is going to be my own personal version of basically what the World Economic Forum get together to do every year in Davos. Uh, there, the world elite, they get together and they design what they think the world should look like 10 years time. And then they lay out the steps that they think will get them to the future that they want. This video is going to be my version of that, that basically painting a more optimistic, a more open, a more decentralized version of where I think we can get to in 10 years time and describing that the uh, how I think that we can make those sort of transitions, what the incentive structures that we need to put in place that will ultimately result in the systems and the behaviors that we want to see. Now, I did hesitate slightly before making this video because it sounds a bit utopian, doesn't it? But actually, it's, it's going to be helpful for all of those reasons and also it'll give you, the viewer, a, a better sense of perspective of where I'm coming from because I've spent a lot of time criticising the existing economic and political power structures. But in order to, uh, I think, be a bit more authentic, you know, it's very easy to criticise. I need to lay out a vision of what I think is better. So in any sense, when I am criticising these things, you understand where I'm coming from and where I think I want to push things towards. Now, I think that this is important um, for the reason, for the same reason, actually, that the World Economic Forum thinks this is important. Because what they have done, and I agree with them on this, is that they recognise that we are entering a process of technological change, which um, fundamentally modifies the way in which you approach these systems. I always refer viewers back to this book, um, The Sovereign Individual. I think it's one of the best books, um, certainly, that I've ever read. Um, and, and what it does is it describes this process in great detail. So I add that to the reading link. You can go and look at it. But essentially, what the claim is, is that every so often you get these big shifts in technological focus that will then filter through and change the political systems and the economic systems. So they start the book by talking about the, the last time that there was a big fundamental change in the underlying logic of these systems, and that was the transition from agriculture to the towns. This occurred at the end of the 14th century. So people, due to technological improvements in, in farming uh, and, and other technological improvements, the yield started to increase and therefore there was abundance. There was, there was at least an excess beyond subsistence levels, um, which led to more people starting to centralise in towns, which took power away from the um, from the bishops and the feudal lords who had been the masters of the agricultural based society. And it started moving it to towns and it started to focus around merchants, around um, guilds. And so there was that process of centralization, which ultimately then led to centralization up to including nation states um, and the expansion of those of those nation states. Now, what this book describes so brilliantly is that we are now entering another big period of inflection where the underlying logic has changed. And that is the transition to the digital age, which break down the, the fundamental um, logics and support sporting pillars for the centralization of the nation state that we have at the moment. This is clearly something that the World Economic Forum understand very well, and they are attempting to front run that change. The the economic um, and the um, governmental changes that are going to have to happen, they want to front run it with a great reset, which is basically finding a way of keeping centralised power structures in place by implementation of you know, effectively digital slavery. So in this episode, I'm going to describe that there is actually a different way that we can go about this, um, a more... Um, positive route, and, and I'm going to try and set that out. Now, just like in the book that I described, um, I think that this starts with um, technology that enables the, um, the fundamental changes to take place. Now, for me, these are going to be, fundamentally, they're going to be the, um, the digitization of information, of value, and identity. So again, these are all things that I've talked about in previous episodes, but the um, digitization of information is essentially the formation of the internet that occurred, you know, put a date on it 20, 25 years ago. The digitization of value is, is more recent, sort of occurred about 10 years ago. That was the invention of blockchain technologies that was expressed through Bitcoin. So now value can be exchanged um, digitally. Um, and then finally, um, identity. That's an important one because it allows you to um, participate as an individual on an online space in, in a way that you can demonstrate you are you. 
And this will be done through something called um, zero knowledge proofs. Now, there are good and ver bad versions of, of each of these, and they have been co-opted to a certain extent. So um, Web 1 was very open and very libertarian. Web 2 is the version that we've got at the moment. Now, that is very um, tightly centrally controlled. It is, it is um, clustering around services. So it is things like Facebook and Google. Web3 is coming, which I think is going to turn things back in favour of the individual, because essentially in Web3, you get to own your data um, at, as sort of an, at the protocol level, um, and then you interact with services, but you're not beholden to them. We'll try and come back to some examples of that. So I think there is a good version of this. Um, blockchains, obviously that can go either way as well. Um, there is um, the open version of this, which is Bitcoin, and then there is the um, uh, co-opted uh, version of this, which will be central bank digital currencies, which is, as you obviously heard in a previous episode, I was um, not a fan of. And um, digital IDs, um, again, um, it is right that people are absolutely suspicious about those because this is one where the, the state has basically done um, the early doors. Um, they, they, they're pushing something out with basically something which is a social credit system, and we should be very suspicious of those that come along. But there is also possible to have a um, a version that we would we would like that we would want and that's the that's the ones based on the zero knowledge proofs that will enable and you do want those because you do want to be able to interact in in a digital sense uh while confirming that is you you don't want your identity stolen you don't want it misappropriated um with all of these things together you can change things like voting systems and the way we interact with, with many many different things so um <sighs> Explaining that protocol and service different, um, you, you can think of this um, in terms of, say, say email, for example. So email, um, it, it's basically structured like a protocol, not like a service. So think about um, uh, contentious political figures, such as Donald Trump. <laughs> Nobody, um, you've, you've never heard anybody pushing to say that Donald Trump should be removed from email. I mean, it's just it's just an absurd idea. It does it doesn't doesn't work conceptually. Even if he was using Gmail and he got shut out of that, I mean, he would just go to one of the alternatives, or because it's a protocol, he would set up his own email server, a bit like Hillary Clinton did, um, if he wanted to go down that route. However, you have heard um, that there is a push to get him um, kicked off of Twitter, and that actually happened. Um, because Twitter is a service; it's not a protocol. It could have been a protocol, but it is a service. And you see, when that decision was being made, when 10 years ago, well, 10, 12 years ago, when, when Twitter was first being established, it could have gone down the other route. It could have become a protocol. But back then, nobody cared about this stuff. Twitter was just, you know, people saying, you know, this is what I had for lunch. These days, everybody cares about it because it has become politically powerful. So what I'm starting to touch on in this video is that there are technologies emerging, which even though nobody particularly cares about them from a political point right now, do believe that in 10 years time these issues are going to be key it is a bit like being 10 years ahead of the whole twitter debate that we're getting into now so it is important that it is not just the centralizers who are thinking about these things it's not just the wef who is talking about um, how do we design the digital landscape going forward it is also something that we should do now i'm not actually going to focus so much on the technological side of this i just mention it to to give context to things what i'm actually going to be focusing on about what you can build on top of those so effectively designing a better system. So I'm going to start with money. Be it money, I do believe is is corrupting us. Um, and, and our previous videos have, have demonstrated that um, a number of times about you know all the ways that this is going wrong for us. And, and the reason it's primarily going so wrong for us is because it's got the wrong incentive structure underlying it, um, especially in the West, very much so in the US with their dollar-denominated global um, reserve system, is it incentivizes consumption over investment um, because if you are a, uh, if you are a country which is which is heavily bought into to the fiat money system effectively what you want to do is you want to create as much debt as you can you want to push that debt out um, abroad as much as you can as well as fostering it on your own citizens in order for um, those foreign countries to to buy your debt well they're going to need your currency how do they get your currency well they get it by by selling you things so what happens is we all end up um, buying far too much you know tat from from china um they then get our money um some of which they use to buy things that they they actually want although less so because they're a uh, an investment-led economy which well to a certain extent china i know there's a lot of debt in there as well um but they uh, but they can then put that back into um into our denominated debt so we have the wrong incentive structures 
where everybody is just trying to consume all the time and not invest, not to build. Uh, and you can see that through our sort of deindustrialization. So, you know, we've we've got to change that. So, you know, let's kick this off. Where, um, how would I change, if I was in charge, how would I start to change this process? Well, clearly we need some sort of hard money system. Um, I would simply note something like £62 million pounds will buy you a metric tonne of gold. Um, Put it another way, we could have bought 8,000 tonnes of gold um, for the same price as lockdowns cost us. So lockdowns cost us about 500 billion. Instead of that insane nonsense and all the damage it did, all the um, the grief and mental anguish and stress that it caused people, apart from all the businesses it's destroyed, the um, horrendous negative health consequences that it gave us, instead of that, we could have 8,000 tonnes of gold, which is about as much as the US has. Um, you know what a game changer that would have been to convert us onto a uh, on, onto a hard money system. Um, for an extra fifty billion, ten uh, percent of that, you could have two point five million Bitcoin at current prices. I appreciate that if you actually try to buy that much, you would spike the price, and so you, you you wouldn't get near it. But you know, I'm giving you an idea that there is there are there are ways that we could transition to a hard money standard, especially when you've got um, the ability to have a printing press. And some countries are blatantly doing this at the moment. Switzerland, for example, is, is a great example of this. Every month they are um, they're basically printing money and then using it to buy to buy gold. They there there are many countries around the world that are ramping up their gold reserves because they are thinking, okay, we are going to have to return to some sort of hard money standard at some point. We are not doing that in this country. And I think I think we should. So that's that's the first part I would start with. Um, I would even say that it is it is not impossible to consider um, some sort of CBDC. Now, hear me out here. It wouldn't be a CBDC as I as I described in the previous episode. It wouldn't be that sort of um, digital surveillance. But it's not necessarily impossible that you could create something like um, a, a Bitcoin. Um, which um, would have the safeguards that you're looking for have. Now, you could split that out a number of ways. Um, you could back it um, quite explicitly with hard assets. So you could say, okay, well, it's you know 25% backed by gold, 5% backed by Bitcoin, and 70% because we say so, rather than 100% of because we say so at the moment. And that's not necessarily completely illegitimate. I, mean, I don't think this is an end case. This is a, this is a transitional step um, because, um, you know, the 70% of what we say so will be backed offensively by the productive output of, of, of the country. And as long as the country continues to produce things that people around the world want, um, that's not completely unviable. Um, if you did it that way, you would have to put in place really strong, and I do mean constitutional level safeguards, um, that you're not going to just start inflating it the way that you have with fiat money before. That probably wouldn't work, to be fair. Um, for example, the US Constitution says that um, money is gold and silver, and of course that has been completely ignored. So even constitutional level safeguards um, um, don't cut it. But potentially you could create something um, which was programmed in from the beginning to have those sort of safeguards. So you would you would um, strip it of the ability to do the surveillance piece that we don't like. Um, you would have an interesting question about, do you want to make any of it reversible? I would say probably not. Um, but you know that's something that, that that could be debated. You probably don't want to have any programmability in it. You do want it to be something that can go peer to peer. And inflation is actually an interesting one. I think as long as it is clearly established in advance what you're trying to achieve with it, um, it it's not necessarily wrong to have inflation to built into it. As long as that monetary policy is well understood in advance and cannot change on a whim. A lot of the problems that we're having now is because we did have a, an established monetary policy which was supposed to be you know two percent inflation a year. Um, that got cheated over time because they kept on redefining what inflation was, as we talked about before. And then in 2020, at the start of the um, the lockdowns, we basically just printed a vast amount of money. And that is washing through the system now and causing all sorts of disruptions. And because we've got this expansionary money supply, governments feel that they can just spend beyond their means at all times. So um, you could have a, you could program in place, um, you know, this Bitcoin. And again, I don't think this is necessarily an end state, but it was something that can transition us to a better, as long as those um, controls were, were as a cemented in the first place. And, and what do I mean by, you know, inflation isn't always necessarily bad. So, so the system that we have with inflation at the moment, it definitely is. Because as we talked about in that previous episode, the inflation that we get at the moment is effectively created at the nexus between um, banks and, and government. And that has led to the massive expansion in the financial sector. Um, with this sort of blockchain technology, it would be possible to create it um, essentially 
directly within the government and used as basically an offset against taxation. So let's say, you know, um, you took the existing UK monetary stock, which is about 3.6 trillion, and you said, okay, well, we're going to have an inflation rate programmed in of 2%. That would basically generate £72 billion a year um, that would go directly to government. And it would be seen as, you know, what it should be seen as, which is a form of tax, which is this money is not going to go, um, not going to be initiated in the private sector through loans. So it's not going to be this sort of expansionary effect through through boosting up the finance sector, it would be directly as a way of, you know, yes, my money is getting 2% weaker over time. Um, but um, but it does mean that it, it's effectively, uh, it, 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 is, it is providing the, the, the services that, that the government gives you. So um, you wouldn't be able to fund all of government this way because, you know, the government that we have at the moment is spending about 1.2 trillion. So if you wanted to do all of that through inflation, you'd be looking at an annual inflation rate of 33%. So so that isn't viable. So it has to be simply one of a package of, of measures. Um, the other thing that you could do with some some of this technology is you could you could change the way that you fundamentally tax. So you could um, have a combination of both that inflation thing that I talked about, but could you also apply a fee to every transaction, say half a percent fee to every transaction that occurs um, that then goes in as taxation? Now, obviously, all taxation is bad, all taxation is theft. But you are going to have to do some of it, unfortunately, um, at least while we're in this transitional stage to a fully decentralized future and whatever may come after, but the version of where we are now. So what do I mean by that? So existing taxation, um, tax taxation is when you want to when you want to stop something. If you if you want less of something, you tax it. Right. And if you want more of something, you subsidize it. Um, you know, I, I, an old friend of mine um, used to say that we should um, tax unemployment. Bit tongue in cheek, but but actually, it's it's kind of true. If you were to tax unemployment, there would be a lot less of it because you you would be um, incentivizing people not to do that. Now, I'm not advocating that, but our current taxation system is basically taxing work. So we are disincentivizing people from from working. We're also disincentivizing people from savings. Um, we tax capital gains, so people are in, less incentivized to move money to to. Um, um, better performing businesses. We tax people when they when they move house quite heavily. So you incentivize people living in um, you know large houses, large family houses that they that their kids have you know left twenty years ago to stay in that house rather than moving to something more appropriate. So the the, the taxation system at the moment, especially what what we do on on, on wages, um, is is a, is a huge um, disincentive. It's I mean, it's, it's it's quite severe. I mean, um, it's not as bad as it was. I mean, before I was born, the the highest rate of tax was, I believe, ninety eight percent. That was on investment income, uh, and it was eighty three percent on earned income. Now, look, obviously, um, if you're at that threshold where any future work is going to be taxed eighty three percent, why why would you work any harder? Why would you do anything more? So you can't have a taxation system which is, which um, encourages you to to basically reach a level and then not want to work anymore um, unless the work is very easy or you really much enjoy it. So there is that sort of dampening effect. Um, so the other thing is that um, we, we, we don't tax capital effectively. And so that leads to people basically, um, it's something that I've talked about quite a lot actually on this show, which is the the divergence in fortunes between people who get most of their income from capital as opposed to those who who work for it. Um, and because the capital and the land and so on assets are not being taxed effectively, you, you get things like, you know, housing developers who have huge stocks of um, land bank, but they sort of refuse to, to develop it and build on it. So by shifting the emphasis on taxation, you can you can change the way it was done. So finally, last thought on, on taxation is uh, another idea that I like to combine with this, uh, uh, along with a, a, a small inflation rate and a, um, a small transaction fee. The other thing with the small transaction fee is that you, um, you, you don't need to surveil anyone. So with an income tax, you need to be quite intrusive. You need to know exactly how much people are earning, you know, what is it they're doing? Where are they doing it? How much are they earning? Um, you know, what, what what's the employer doing? How much are they kicking back on national insurance? You know, you you need to really get into everybody's business. Whereas the two things I've talked about so far, there is zero intrusion. You know, the government does not need to know what you're up to at any stage. It doesn't need to know how much you earn. None of that. It is simply a, it is a programmatic. You know, every transaction it comes out of it. Right, land value tax. This is an idea that I've liked for a long time. 
um, it, it does get a bit more difficult in the digital world. But but a land value tax is um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll find a, a video that explains it. I can add it to the reading link, the, the reading list. Um, but it is a tax on the unimproved value of land. So again, why am I talking about this in a video which is all about incentives? Because, okay, let's imagine you've got um, very valuable land. You've got two plots of land in, say, Mayfair, London, very valuable land. Um, at the moment, if you've got an empty plot, it is taxed um, a tiny, tiny fraction of the plot next door, which has a business on it, which is doing something useful and productive. A land value tax um, taxes the, the, the value of the land equally, regardless of, of how productively it is being used. And so that unimproved lot would have the same as the, the one with a the, with the viable business on it. Right, so why is that important? Because what it incentivizes you to do is to make the maximum use out of um, valuable land. And again, you do not need to get intrusive on any of this. You don't need to be going into that business and saying, okay, um, um, produce this you know, complicated tax return. Let me see what's going on. Let me send the tax inspectors around. You simply need to know the value of the land, which is you know, essentially a function of um, you know, you know, where it is and, and, and the size of it. So again, with all of these measures, you incent the right behavior and you also significantly reduce the extent to which the, the state has to has to has to spy on you again don't love any of these um um for themselves but these for me some of the least worst ways of um getting the results um that you want um while also disincentivizing effectively the parasite class the the ones who just extract economic rents without having to do anything who just sort of hold on to assets without without contributing anything for them so um you know that's important, and, and and actually, one of the things I've often thought is that um, the way we have structured society is again, it's always to the benefit of that the sort of the capital class. So I mean, I, I look at something like welfare and think, you know, this is essentially a method to um, um, to to so support that capitalistic class because you know you either you either have to give up your wages or um, if if you can't do that, it's basically, it basically provides a safety net, so you never actually have to um, look again at how you're doing any of these things. Okay. Um, turn on to the political structures. And this is where I want to come back to my point about um, how technology underlines um, the way that we um, construct these systems. So what is the technology that the um, current political structure is based around? Well, essentially, it's a saddle. It's, it's a man with a horse. And what do I mean by that is, is that when our current political systems are structured in the first place, you know, I'm, and I'm going to put this at, say, 1860, the, the Great Reform Acts. I mean, there was, there was iterations of it before it, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, pin it back to then. Um, how did our democracy work? Well, you know, every four or five years, you'd have a vote. And then a man, he got on his horse, he got on his saddle, and he, and he rode off to Westminster. And then you didn't see him again for four years, and he came back and there was, a, there was another vote. And... What that gives us is a number of very poor um, behaviours. It gives a re it gives us a really bad set of incentives. So first of all, um, the politicians they go off and they get themselves lost in this Westminster bubble, and they 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 fail to appreciate the world outside of it as much as they should. But also, what you're doing is you're is you're splitting the country up into 650 constituencies, and and the metric is who can get the first one past the post. So it's not even necessarily the you know, it's not somebody who gets fifty percent of the vote. You know, you can you can win um, a constituency election by winning you know twenty five percent of the vote, as long as the next highest person got twenty four percent. So it is it is simply about um, not not even majorities. It is about the um, the person with the um, uh, most cohesive minority, the largest minority. Now. Um, what does that get us as an incentive structure when applied to politics? David Cameron is a good example of this. So David Cameron um, read PPE at Oxford. Um, I'll tell you what the first PPE class, um, the first economics class of that um, is at Oxford. Economics 101 at Oxford is, um, they give you a scenario. There's a mile long beach and there are two ice cream sellers and they start at either end of this beach. And the rules are that um, people on the beach will go to the nearest ice cream seller. And the question is, where do those ice cream sellers end up standing? And the answer to the, to the question is they both end up um, right in the middle of the beach, right next to each other. 
and actually, if you play it out in your mind, you'll see why that is. Is because you know at the beginning they're both on the both on the edges. There's always the incentive for the uh, for the other one to move um, um, to basically split the difference between the edge and the other one because that way there is more um, people who are closest to you. So they both follow the uh, the the, um, the game theory. They both basically end up uh, pressed right up against each other because at least that way they get the full amount of people to the left and the right. That is our that is our political structure. Um, Cameron clearly understood that because, well, Blair understood it as well because the first thing that Blair did when he came into the Labour Party is he moved the Labour Party at least, if if not in practice as to how they would govern, but um, uh, in in terms of narrative, uh, you know, he moved it you know right next to the to the Tory Party at the time. Uh, Cameron, when he came in, again he he understood this lesson. So the first thing he did was he basically made um, the Conservative Party basically new Labour in all but name. Uh, because he was trying to cluster around that centre point in order to get the maximum number of voters um, from from basically anyone on the right. So, you know, what does that do um, in terms of the result? What what behaviours and outcomes come from this as a political system? Well, essentially, what you end up with is is massive amounts of groupthink. Um, you end up with politicians um, trying to, um, you know, nudge us. Um, to the right outcomes because they feel that they, they, they've got the centre ground, they, they understand where it is. Um, you end up with um, policy being driven from, a, you know, a very globalist um, perspective. You get the the shuttering out of anything other than the most um, mainstream normie view. A great example of that would be um, what we saw over over lockdowns. So 600 and, well, I know the some of the um, the Sinn Féin members don't take their seat, but basically every every MP who was eligible to vote and, and present um, voted for those first lockdowns. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.